Başka bir şey I'm going to talk about this ritualized behavior thing. Uh, the, I'll ask you to do something that is pretty difficult, which is to suspend or bracket or ignore some of your intuitions. There's something that happens a lot when I talk about ritual and ritualized behaviors that some people at the end say, well, but that's not what I mean by ritual. For me, ritual is like, you know, this and this and that, um, which is so um, interesting, but not quite entirely relevant. Um, and, but, you know, I'm, you know, confident that we can do that because this is a group of self uh, selected uh, clever people, half of whom are Hungarian anyway and therefore genetically smarter than the rest of us. So that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, this is collaborative work that I did with Pierre Lenar, who's a postdoc in Washington University. Many anthropologists um, ask this kind of question, or rather, um, wonder about this when they're in the field, you know, why do people bother to do these complicated things like these guys? And incidentally, I have no idea, I mean, contrary to Maurice, I have no idea what these images are about because my entire life is in uh, Google images and YouTube, therefore I have lost reference to the real world. So <laughs> don't ask me what these guys are doing. I don't know. They are somewhere on the web. That's it. Um, I know that people never listen to more than three minutes of talk, therefore, uh, here's the message, and the rest will just be pretty pictures. Um, the message that we think that among those many systems that uh, are part of our evolutionary equipment, what we have is an evolved, uh, what we call hazard precaution system, and this hazard precaution system has a specific domain, which is that it focuses on potential fitness threats that humans have encountered throughout evolutionary history. Uh, it has specific principles of operation. As, as it happens, it also has specific neural circuitry, which is not uh, always true of specific systems. But for this one, it may well be the case. Um, the, what we try to show about ritualized behavior in individuals is that it consists in specific activation or overactivation, hyperactivation of that system. And um, that can lead to pathologies like uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, what we have to say about cultural soundness will be really uh, short and will be at the end of this talk. And it's that they're uh, mostly derivative. Uh, that is that there is no, uh, it's not part of the functional principles of that kind of system that it produces what anthropologists call ritual. The rituals, what anthropologists usually call rituals, may gain some of their relevance, interest, attention grabbing potential, and compelling nature from that system. If you, think, if you think that all these statements are perfectly clear, or if you think they're perfectly convincing, or both, uh, you can start to doze off because the rest is just the illustration of these points, okay? Mm -hmm. So, the anthropological question is why do people perform rituals? And again, do not ask me. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> Right, why perform rituals? Well, the, the, the first thing that you, and that's why I asked you to suspend your intuition, is that the word ritual is very, very bad, and we shouldn't be using it. And actually, I shouldn't be using it, except you wouldn't be listening if I were using English <laughs> words, so I have this problem there. But um, rituals has never been, you know, there are some, there must be some concepts in anthropology that have precise definition, uh, but ritual is not one of them, okay? And, um, it's, it's got poor definition, it's not a very good object. People say, well, I was studying religious rituals among the so and so, and people have a vague idea of what that must be. Uh, but that's as, uh, about as far as it goes. A consequence of that is that you have this set of things that people have talked about and they call rituals, and sometimes people produce theories of rituals. And theories of rituals are attempts to put all these things together and see what the common features are. And the general sort of characteristic of theory of ritual is that it says that it's very expressive and very inexpressive, it's very dynamic and very static, and it's very social and totally individual and very emotive and totally individual. So, and I think that kind of, and many people think that that's actually great because it shows what an incredibly complex social object ritual is. No, it shows what happens when you have poor category. Okay, so uh, what we focus on is not what we usually call rituals, but what, some, what I used to call ritualized behavior. 
every time I call into child behavior, sometimes some people will say, well, hang on a minute, because you know what happens in ritual, what I mean by ritual is this and this and this, and that's not the way you describe it. Um, and I had this problem so many times that uh, Harvey Whitehouse told me, well, if you don't want people to derive inferences from those words, don't use the wrong words. Just call it XB24. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will try to explain to you what XB24 is and why it's interesting. Now, XB24 is what you get. And again, I have no idea why you came up with this acronym. Mm -hmm. um, is what you get when you have a set of actions such that there's a compulsion that is People say that you must perform this set of actions that's been named. Uh, you have scribblingness, that is, you must do it the right way. You have gold emotion, which is something I will talk about, uh, which means basically that in order to do to get a certain effect or to do these things, you have to do a whole variety of sub actions, but you cannot see the or there's no need to have any interpretation of the connection between those sub-actions and the general goal. And there's a lot of internal redundancy, like you do it many times, or you do it uh, repeatedly, or you do it although there's absolutely no point in doing it. Um, and I give you examples of that. Uh, great anthropologist, the late uh, Roy Rappaport, um, asked this question, you know, why bother to do this? And had a series of articles where he said it's interesting that anthropologists have been saying us I mean talking a lot about rituals, but they haven't told us really why people would perform that. And it's interesting it's important to understand what the question is. What he means is not why do people perform their rituals. Um, because there are all sorts of problems of courses, you know. Uh, you get to you know take drugs, meet people, um, you know, you hear good music or bad music, you get to dance, so you get to get beaten up or things like that. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons. Um, there's even a sort of uh, um, the uh, dance burger theory of ritual, which is that uh, it's more of a bother to be fake than to be high. You know, the cost of saying, hang on a minute, I'm a Protestant, but I want to change this and this and that is so much greater than the uh, boredom of going through another Quaker meeting that like your meetings are incredibly stable. Which, all these things are probably true, uh, but they still don't tell us why. And also, some of the ultimate reasons that people have come up with, like, you know, create social cohesion, removes tension in the society, or constitutes a costly signal <coughs> that's a more precise sort of hypothesis. This is great. All this may well be true, but doesn't answer the question, why do people perform cultural rituals? This is why ritual ritualized behavior. And the point is that you can have all the fun, the emotion, the sex, the drugs, the rock and roll, everything, <laughs> without scripted action that's redundant and so on and so forth. So why this specific kind of action? Where? That's Roy Rappaport's question. Sorry. Where? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in Dallas. There's a map. map. <laughs> There's a map in some. We get those five <laughs> tomorrow at ten. Okay. Um, the Trump Court also had. Uh, and other apologists have asked this question, you know, there's something interesting about these uh, XB24 ritualized actions that we see in human societies, which is that very, very often they go with a whole set of themes that seem to be the same all the time. Uh, preoccupation with purity, pollution, cleansing, contamination. Uh, preoccupation with order and boundaries, like aligning things, creating a certain space, and there's in this space and outside the space which you could call sacred space and so on and so forth. Preoccupations with order, symmetry, certain colors, certain numbers, and things like that. These things seem to crop up in so many different cultures. Why always the same themes in this ritualized behavior? In order to understand that this is an important question, you have to understand that it's not just a question about some cultural ceremonies. It's a question about behaviors that happen in humans in all sorts of other contexts. And I think crucial uh, to understanding why this happened and why this happened in that particular way is to understand that they happen in many different contexts and cultural ceremonies may not be the canonical context out of which we'll get a good account of why they occur. Um, so again, uh, interesting behavior, but I have no idea what these fellows are doing. Um, I think the only way to stay awake is to have some relevant mysteries to focus on, so if you can... Yeah. 
Well, where do we see rituals? Uh, we see them in lots of, uh, sorry, ritual, I should have said, XB24, in cultural performances. That's uh, what prompted this question, but also in obsessive impulsive patients, in normal children, and in normal adults. Uh, and cultural rituals, there are, these are you know, pictures to, uh, you know, whatever these people are doing is probably is a ritual. Um, and there are certain signals to which we recognize these things. I remember this cartoon with a farmer whose cow has been, you know, someone's done something to the cow so that the cow is wearing uh, a big hat with flowers and stockings and lipstick. And the cop says, it's a cult. <laughs> okay. Uh, normal children, uh, pretty pictures are you know, not terribly good in this way. Uh, normal children do lots of ritualized things, like having little collections, arranging objects, um, uh, putting, uh, lining up objects, pencils, things like that, insisting on specific order for objects, but of course also on specific routines, like you know, going to bed, having stories told in a certain order, and things like that. They're terribly like that. They're terribly like that between the ages of two and eight. And uh, very much to, um, and it's not absolutely clear that we have a great account of why they do that in uh, cognitive development or psychology. But it's something that happens. Now, um, ritual, ritualized behavior, but also a lot of anxiety, and I'll tell you why anxiety is interesting here, happens around certain periods in the life cycle. And birthing, uh, giving delivery, but also being a young father, are things that create certain anxieties, but also what um, what the OBGYN uh, what's OBGYN yes. in standard English mm -hmm. obstetricians. obstetricians we uh, work with in Saint Louis call women being annoying, mm -hmm. uh, which means and superstitious, irrational, and they even tell us if you want to study this, that will be great because at least they'll talk to you, and we won't have to listen to all this. Mm -hmm. okay. Because pregnant women and after birth, both men and women tend to have all sorts of worries and they often develop superstitions. Okay, so if I do this, my child will be all right. I know it's absurd, but... You know. So these are young fathers, probably young fathers. Um, now, the spectacular domain where we see lots of XB24, uh, also known as ritualized behavior, is obsessive compulsive disorder, like people who wash their hands, you know, three hours a day or six hours a day and can't do much about it, or people who lock their doors and then check that they're locked and then check again and then check that they didn't make a mistake in checking the first time and so on and so forth. So these are things that um, happen. Now, in all these domains, you find this compulsion. You have to do the thing. You don't know why you have to do the thing, but you have to do the thing. Uh, uh, you must do it. Uh, the reason is not necessarily explicit. It's, um, it's true also of cultural rituals. Because people would say, well, you know, when you do a bar mitzvah, you know why you're doing a bar mitzvah. Well, true. But in most of the societies Morris was talking about uh, an hour ago, uh, actually, there is no official explanation. And even in the places where there is an explanation, people don't really care what the explanation is. It's not their reason for doing the thing, as it were. There's a rigid script, but there's no justification for the script. Um, some people, for example, some patients have this notion that my children could have, you know, um, no, that's not bad. Um, my uh, spouse will uh, probably catch a horrible disease, and what I have to do is uh, do this, and then do that, and then do that. And it's very important that I don't do this, and that, and that, because that would be wrong. And that's part of the obsession that you have to do it in that order. But in, the same t in the same way, you know, anyone who's in interacted with two to five-year-olds who have routines knows that um, there's no way to tell them, hey, you could just you know, change the order. It would be just the same. Um, and my son developed sort of routines like you know, the proper way to start the car is to disengage the thing, thing the, the steering wheel, stuff like that. And when I do it wrong, he gets very upset and I have to do it all over again. <laughs> and despite my arguments that the car will start anyway and it's not a problem and you know, we've been a bit late. It, that mm -hmm. Okay, so there's lots of internal redundancy. Uh, in many cultural rituals, you have to do things like you know, go around uh, a blind cow seven times clockwise. Why seven times? You know, if you do it once, wouldn't, you know, 
And if it's a certain number of times, you should you know, have your analog system sort of firing and say, well, anywhere between six and eight <laughs> will be okay. But no, it's seven. It's always seven. You also have redundancy in the sense that you know, for uh, certain Indonesian rituals, for example, you circulate a uh, very nice white chicken around people. I think it's clockwise in Indonesia. I was told it's always clockwise, otherwise everyone dies on the spot. No one is going to try that. But uh, the thing is that the, uh, the chicken has then to be washed three times to be perfectly clean. But of course, no one will start a ritual with a dirty chicken. Okay. So it's clean. Okay. So you have to clean something that's clean. That's that. But again, you get those particular themes. And that's important to realize that those themes, like contagion, danger, boundaries, order, and symmetry, they are present in young children's rituals, in uh, pregnant women and young fathers' anxieties, in uh, cultural rituals, and in OCD behaviors. They're the same themes. So why this same behavior and those same themes? Now, um, Pierre and I are now the, same, the first people to ask this question. And uh, we have, you know, we're happy to stand on the shoulders of giants, as it were. Uh, Sigmund Freud had this, uh, had noticed that, like many other people, I'm sure, and uh, had a very uh, pithy and uh, interesting thing to say, except that it's not very helpful. So I don't think we need to go He's just saying that it's the same. He says it in many words because it's German. Uh, Sorry, he's Austrian. What he says is that um, these analogies show, between those behaviors, show that maybe religion is a connected um, um, obsessive neurosis, and maybe obsessive neurosis is a private religion. Sure. And that's the last page of this essay. And I remember reading that and thinking, there's only three pages left, so the you know, massive theory called punch is going to come. And this is the last sentence. Uh, okay, that's uncharacteristically uh, bland from this fellow. Okay, the, the way to understand the whole thing, I think, is to uh, focus on OCD, on the pathology, and then go back to what is not pathological and what is um, culturally widespread and so on and so forth. All right, the uh, OCD pathology consists in both intrusive thoughts about various themes and compulsions to perform certain actions. Uh, the intrusive thoughts are typically, uh, again, the uh, specialists sort of uh, lively describe these people as washers, checkers, washers, checkers, um, and which would mean basically that the obsessions, the intrusive thoughts tend to be about um, contamination, contagion, germs, things like that. But they're also about social responsibility um, and social offense. Uh, there are cases like, for example, a patient who is obsessed by the idea that before going to work, uh, when he arrives at work, he will scribble uh, insults and you know, various sort of vulgar uh, obscenities on uh, his colleagues. No, uh, notepads on their desks. So what he does is go, is arrive an hour before the others and checks that he hasn't done it. And then of course he has to check again, and to check again, because as he was checking one, it could have been really fun. And then more, he has to do it. Okay. So these are intrusive thoughts that can be about social offense, about contagion, about hoarding. Uh, quite a few people who although it's a sort of small part of OCD, patients hold their uh, rubbish, for example, and they, their house is full of their rubbish, because there might be something important in their rubbish that they, they might be throwing by mistake, so, but it's really unpleasant to get a rumble through your rubbish, so you just keep the bags, and then your house is gradually invaded by this thing. People's lives in general in those pathologies is invaded by the pathology in the sense at the same time or in space. Um, Lots of people wash, lots of people check, and a few people hoard. Uh, quite a few people have this uh, disorder of counting everything. Um, I don't think we have a, no, we don't have a, an Ethernet connection. But anyway, it would be complicated. But there are good, uh, if you Google OCD, uh, 
if like you, look, your life has disappeared from the real world and only happens on YouTube, if you Google or you, you know, put uh, OCD in YouTube, you'll find all sorts of nice videos of people who, for example, go, can only walk and, um, for se seven steps and then have to go back and then come back. And, you know, you see this young woman who's perfectly nice with her friends and her friends are kind of used to it, so after seven, okay. <laughs> And it's really funny, but it's uh, one reason for uh, saying that it's um, it's okay to say it's funny in a way because I mean it's politically correct as well because the the patients generally have good insight. Sorry, this is uh, good insight, which means that uh, OCD patients are not. I mean, not being a clinical psychologist, I'm simply saying that they're not crazy. Uh, and uh, but in clinical psychology, it's not exactly expressed that way. And you say that people have good insight, which means that the patient goes to see a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist and says, "I have a problem. I know these ideas are absurd. I know I don't have to do my shoelaces seven times in order to avoid a uh, car accident, but I can't help. You know, I have to do it. But I know it's absurd, which is very different from someone saying, "I'm." Uh, I have a problem because the CIA is trying to put force in my head that I don't want, so please help me with the CIA. You know, <laughs> which is a bit different. Now, a um, um, very important point is that another contrast with pathologies like schizophrenia is that there is a real continuum between the normal case and the pathological case. So, for example, if your child uh, likes to line up pencils for half an hour every day, that's okay. They do it two hours, you take them to a child psychologist who says this is pre-OCD kind of behavior. Um, there are lots of gray areas between, you know, norm, uh, which is why DSM has this category of um, OCD-like uh, behavior, subclinical OCD presentation, uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, and so on and so forth. Uh, the patients don't have special obsessions. That's another difference with the uh, delusional obsessions. That is, uh, the obsessions that uh, patients have, or the intrusive, intrusive thoughts that they have, are the same that we all have. Uh, that is, they're worried about uh, um, people like Reichman and Da Silva, who did community studies of how many people have thoughts about contagion and, and so on and so forth, found that the, um, not just the themes of the obsessions, but the frequency of their occurrence was more or less the same in patients and in all people. That is, an OCD person is not someone who thinks about contagion in a different way from you, or thinks about contagion even that more often than you. It's someone whose thoughts about contagion are so much more intense and tragic that they have to do something about it. Um, and that too is important. All right, so um, generally the only way to persuade people that there's something specific in the mind is to show them that there's something local in the brain. And uh, I use this in purely um, sort of rhetorical way. The um, the circuitry that's uh, although it's, it's interesting, the circuitry that's interest that, that that's there is really highly specific, and what it does is connect in, in a kind of loop um, cortical and basal ganglia structures with the thalamus. So there's a kind of uh, circle of information that goes like that, and I actually have another. I think that is, yeah, that's much more, much clearer. Um, <laughs> this is the mind. <laughs> With its motor areas and frontal cortex and orbital frontal cortex, that, uh, as my colleagues in cognitive neuroscience say, we must never anthropomorphize the mind because that's bad. But they say, and then the SMA talks to the putain man. <laughs> Chordate uh, and nucleus accumbens. What you have to, and um, anterior cingulate cortex. What you have to remember from that is simply that there are two ways. So these are basal ganglia, sort of emotional and regular behavior, routinized behavior kind of structures. Uh, what you have to remember, and this is thalamus, which is a sort of relay structure, is that there are two links. One that is ex um, excitation links that's reinforces information flow between putamen, that is sort of standard behaviors, to all these structures like subplantia nigra and thalamus to make them available for motor 
action. And there's an inhibitory um, series of links that is there. The pathology of OCD resides in the um, influx of, or sort of balance of neurotransmitters between these two. <coughs> and the fact that these uh, inhibitory links are degraded or uh, simply, <coughs> all these are overactive. Actually, the two are regulated by the same neurotransmitter. Uh, it's not clear that uh, there's not much <coughs> neuroimaging of these things for several reasons. Uh, one is that these are small bits of the brain. Um, another one is that they're very central. And, but the main one is that what happens here is uh, deal with neurotransmitters that don't produce much effect because they're like GABA, whereas neuroimaging is about other kinds of um, activity. So we, all this is deduced from, and uh, <coughs> obviously this is not my model. Okay. <laughs> this is science. This is, this is, this is, this is true. <laughs> That's all you have to remember about it. And the proof that it's true is that I have no idea where it comes from. Oh, well, it comes from a whole variety of sources. But I did draw the diagram, so I have some sort of command of what I'm talking about. Uh, what I'm saying is that its true value is not established by my own research at all. Now, what you have is uh, a general picture of what the OCD brain, as it were, is like, is that there's a hypervigilance, because there's uh, neuroimaging studies have shown differences to normal um, uh, compared to normal uh, in various different ways. There's hypervigilance to certain danger cues, which is hypervigilance that occurs in the anterior single. There's excessive production of motor plans, especially activation of pre-digested, as it were, scripted motor plans in basal ganglia towards thalamus. And also, very importantly in OCD, there's a failure in inhibition in uh, orbital frontal cortex. This, um, so these neuro, uh, neuro correlate kind of arguments show that they, they confirm what the clinical uh, mm -hmm. picture suggests, which is that there really is a continuity. All the structures are present in normal brains, obviously, but they all do exactly what they do in the OCD brain in the normal brain, except to a slightly different degree. So there's excessive function rather than dysfunction, really. Uh, also to briefly finish with this survey of OCD. Um, there are two kinds of models of OCD. What I call cognitive models of OCD. Um, put forward, it's named mainly in the 1980s. People like Sapkowski, Zreichman, and all the others. And their idea is that what happens in OCD patients is that the thoughts about danger and things like that are just appraised, cognitively appraised, in a different way from non-patients. So that um, this notion that um, I may have um, written insulting words on my colleague's notepad uh, is taken to be a very important fact about social, social life, whereas for most people uh, there would be a kind of um, different appraisal which would say, well, even if I did, that's not that bad. That's the cognitive theory. The, Cognitive model didn't have much support except that it's connected uh, to cognit cognitive behavior therapy, which kind of works, like for phobias, which works by exposure and creating new associations. So you just tell the patients to uh, first to think about having their car crash and not touch the computer. And you train them in doing that. And then you train them in touching the computer and thinking about something else and so on. But it's very, very simple sort of thing. So did your friend have to go and write those notes and stick them on people's desks? Uh, he's not my friend. He's a <laughs> patient of, <laughs> of Dr. Altman's <laughs> in St. Louis. Um, yes, they did things like that. I mean, sort of uh, have him tell the doctor, you know, uh, you're not terribly good looking. And the doctor said, hey, I know. <laughs> and you realize that social offense is not that, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's incredibly simple and simplistic as, as, as a therapy. Um, it works, and uh, it kind of works, and it works better if you add SSRIs, that is, uh, um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, in other words, this. Uh, that, that 
affecting the serotonin balance has a great effect on that. And then the cognitive therapy can kick in because it's much easier to, to do. There's um, an alternative to cognitive models are safety models of OCD, uh, which have been proposed by various people like uh, Anne Graybeal, Henry Sechman, and other neuropsychologists. And the idea is that there are systems in the mind that are there to be aware of, potential, of dangerous signals in the environment. <laughs> that there are also atavistic or sort of old or extremely primitive uh, cis, dis, defense sort of um, actions, like cleaning, like, um, no, yes, like cleaning, that's a good example. And that would happen, that would be those things that are stored as action routines in the basal ganglia. Uh, Anne Graybill is one of those people, but also um, Nancy, Nancy Rappaport, no, not Nancy. But Rappaport, Judith Rappaport, um, does that. Um, um, and has done sort of, you know, all sorts of neuro, neuropharmacological and neuroimaging studies that seem to show that. Um, also, an argument in these danger models, and that's been put forward by Henry Sechman in particular, is that in ordinary uh, minds, the performance of those atavistic actions uh, creates a sense of what he calls satiety or um, a sense of safety. And the idea is that in patients you do not reach that. So somehow the link between performing certain actions and creating this sense of, of uh, satiety or, or, or safety has not been, has been damaged. Uh, the evidence for that comes from animal models. There is actually an animal model of OCD uh, in the rat. That is, uh, you can give uh, rats various substances that um, trigger OCD presentation in the rats, so the rats become obsessive compulsive. Uh, well, they, they become compulsive, obsessive, we're not sure. Um, and they start uh, performing all sorts of ri uh, rituals, and all sorts of <laughs> actions that are repeated, redundant, stylized. Um, but of course, these are all sort of in the rat re rat's repertoire. So there are things like cleaning their cage, checking that there's no one around, and then going back to their little enclosure, and then checking again, and then checking again, and doing it in more and more stylized, repetitive ways. So that's the animal model. <laughs> the evidence also comes from neuropharmacology, obviously from the actions of various neurotransmitters, from neuroimaging, but not from clinical studies. That is, this is uh, a really sort of neuro uh, psychological model, but not a clinical model. This is a um, sort of uh, summary of the of this sort of safety signal, which is that these action plans are there, but their performance in normal people creates this sort of just right uh, kind of feeling that things are okay, uh, which feeds back into the appraisal of anxiety level. All this is projected onto onto various uh, brain structures in a way that's subtle, complicated, and totally irrelevant in the present argument, so I won't do it. So, uh, given all these facts, here's our argument, um, which goes back to evolutionary um, statements and uh, considerations. We think it's important to distinguish between two kinds of fitness threats uh, that uh, humans and other animals have to deal with. Uh, some of them uh, are those that require immediate action and trigger uh, reactions like freezing, uh, uh, sorry, freezing, fleeing, uh, fighting, and things like that. And we know from the research of many uh, neuropsychologists and uh, brain images and uh, animal behavior people that there are specific neural networks for those. But there are th threats that require preventative action. Like, for example, inspecting your environment to be sure that there aren't any predators, rather there are no traces of predators. Uh, avoidance and precaution, like, uh, for example, if you have some sort of social uh, anxiety, like you think that you're losing status, it's a relatively good strategy in many contexts to just avoid contact with people, because you avoid, uh, like this uh, patient is, has this uh, problem that he may be insulting people without realizing, so he's specifically, he's described as socially anxious as well as OCD, and no wonder. Uh, his strategy is to avoid meeting people. Here too, I think there are specific neural systems, but we won't go into that again, okay? Now, 
Uh, I give you some examples of manifest fitness threats. Um, if you, you know, encounter people who really don't look like conspecifics, um, or if you look, uh, or if you see, you know, well, this is one that triggers uh, specific responses, or predators, or people who don't look like, you know, it's not the sort of, you know, the milk of human kindness in short supply. You know, this guy is, seems to have a beef. Something. Um, so these are these are manifest. Okay. So if the people are there, you have to do something there. Okay. Although this guy, well, anyway, these are inferred fitness threats. Now, uh, this looks like food. Okay. Except it looks like food you shouldn't treat as food. Okay. It's a, you don't really want to, you know. <laughs> and if people tell you, this is the thing, you know, in 10 minutes the goulash will be ready. <laughs> uh, I can't give you the idea. <laughs> it's like a lot of paprika to eat. Now, if you're in an environment like this, you have an inferred fitness threat. That is, there is no danger here. But what you realize is that there's an absence of resources that is kind of worrying. And indeed, there's a memento mori that tells you what's going to happen to you really soon. Okay. Uh, well, okay, this is a bit of a joke, but if you have <laughs> traces of intrusion in your environment from someone, <laughs> this guy looks pretty sanguine about it. <laughs> now, this is a special case. These guys obviously are not a threat. They're victims of the uh, fitness threats because of the of social exclusion and ostracism. And I, I, I wanted to put it, but it's not a very good taste, because uh, one of the major sources of fitness threats, indirect fitness threats in humans, is uh, the social world. That is, you know, high key status and uh, ostracism, social categorization, and things like that. Now, what we think is that this defines a kind of repertoire class of things that, um, that uh, people should be able to detect, or it would be a good thing if they detect them. Uh, cues like cues to contagion and contamination. Cues to potential predator intrusion. Cues to potential social effects. Um, and these are species specific. I mean, you don't expect, uh, for example, contamination, contamination and contagion are things that humans, as opposed to other uh, primates, should be, uh, sh they should be sensitive, about, uh, sensitive to those uh, in a special way because they're generalists. Okay? Uh, so, like rats. Unlike the boons. And you know, there's all these uh, boons are not special. Uh, are pretty generous. Unlike giraffes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, that is, since we more or less sample all the possible nutrients in our, in our environment, we have to have some strategies to uh, adapt to new environments but avoid the cost of you know, contagion and contamination. Also, potential predator intrusion is very important in humans because we're not very good at fighting bears and uh, tigers, and the archaeological record is full of people who met an untimely demise because they hadn't activated these systems you know, early enough. So the, the, the risk of pred predation by big animals is not, a, uh, is not a joke in human evolution. And crucially, we should have, uh, or we should have, it would be a good thing to have, uh, some sensitivity to uh, potential uh, social offense uh, cues because we are so highly dependent on socially transmitted information, but also on simple things like uh, socially um, shared resources, availability of other people's resources, and so on and so forth. So uh, losing your status is almost as bad as encountering a predator in that way. Also, these fitness um, considerations kind of define an abstract you know, task domain uh, where you have this precaution repertoire that would be appropriate to each danger, like you know, washing <laughs> or rubbing uh, wounds or um, uh, avoiding source of contaminants, like you know, when you see that nice pig that looks so good with all those maggots and stuff like that, that creates a smell that most humans find <coughs> uh, repulsive. Also, people are not interested in touching other people's rods or, you know, then I spare you the rest of uh, that kind of stuff. So, 
Um, social offense too. We we uh, it's it's interesting to see that people are incredibly good at monitoring very subtle social cues and cues to status differences, things like that. Uh, we should have some sort of strategy of avoiding uh, contact with people when the social world is becoming dangerous. Predator intrusion is a bit special, and here I have an no argument that that is extremely convincing, but even I don't <coughs> find it totally convincing, uh, which is that a good way of minimizing this would be to make your environment so orderly and predictable that you would detect if there are predators or sort of all the other intruders that have been around. Uh, but anyway, this is very speculative. Um, again, in this abstract sort of evolutionary a priori description of what the task domain is, uh, you have to realize, and this is a point that uh, Sachin and, and Woody have emphasized um, in their brain model of OCD, that there's a big asymmetry in precaution, which is that the signals of danger are always external cues from the environment, like the, the smell, or they can be, like smell of um, rotting pig, or the fact that uh, you make a joke and people don't laugh. Whereas they joked to, uh, they laughed at another joke that someone more powerful, but the joke wasn't funny, but they did laugh and stuff like that. You know, these things are there, and they're sort of elements of information that you find in the world. Now, if you take your precaution, it may be that your precaution that you've taken has made the world safer for you, but there's no external source of information that tells you that. So, uh, you know, you, I mean, it's going to be some time before you realize that that's the case. Um, therefore, there's that kind of um, brain uh, or sort of functional design problem that uh, safety should, in many cases, be an internally generated variable. That is, it's not that people sample the environment to make sure they're safe. It's rather that they take precautions, and that makes them think that the environment is safe. Because there are, there's a little bit of an asymmetry here. Okay, so how does that uh, explain anything to do with ritual? Well, okay. What we think is going on, and this is the, the part that's really our model, is that uh, what you have in these processes is that you have intrusive thoughts or concerns. Like, uh, I'm going to have a car crash and I can have some visual imagery of what's going to happen and how horrible it's going to be. Uh, and then what happens is that uh, you have a very specific treatment of your own action flow. That is, and this is something that happens in other pathologies, not just in OCD. Um, uh, a focus, an exclusive focus on very low level aspects of the action. In such a way that it requires very high attentional uh, focus and control. And we think this kind of stuff, uh, I'll tell you why and how, uh, swamps working memory. Uh, in such a way that it lowers the likelihood of intrusive thought. Here's why that should be the case. Look at those compulsive uh, actions that you find, especially in patients, but also in children. Uh, you have a simple action that's monitored, like you know, doing your shoelaces. This action is repeated. It relieves the accessibility of the obsession. And there's no automaticity. No one. Uh, and that's you know an uh, important point about OCD rituals, but also children's rituals. People who perform them pay attention to what they are doing. Okay, I'll give you another sort of uh, thing. This is these are examples of the rules that define these sort of uh, XB24 uh, 24 actions. You have to do X n times. Do your shoelaces three times. That's a good example. Don't do your shoelaces. Do sh your shoelaces three times. Do it in a particular way, sticking out your tongue. Do X but not Y, and that's an extremely frequent thing that you find in both um, patients' rituals and to some degree in cultural rituals. Uh, be careful with not to touch the socks as you're doing your shoelaces. That's a very important thing. Now, the general sort of feature of that kind of action is that you take something that either is or could very easily become automatic, like doing your shoelaces, and you introduce features that make it impossible to do it in this automatic way and require high cognitive control. So, for example, um, doing your shoelaces is something that you can do as you are trying to whistle uh, you know, a little tune by Schoenberg. 
but doing your shoelaces three times, taking out your tongue without touching your socks is something that will make your recall of Schoenberg <coughs> less than optimal. And that's because the attentional resources that are invested in this are too, too big. So what patients say, actually, which is very close to our model, is that they fight intrusive thoughts with rituals. And there's an immediate payoff. Uh, they say that when they have their thoughts about dangerous things, the, intru the intrusive thoughts disappear when they perform their rituals. The phenomenology of the disease agrees with the, the model. Uh, oh, yes. And also, interestingly, what uh, patients come up with in terms of rituals, when you're doing this as you're doing that, and pay attention to that, are very much like what cognitive psychologists come up with when they're trying to test working memory in people, and divided memory. So you'll have to respond when this uh, thing goes, but also pay attention that you have to do this you know, five times and stuff like that. The, the uh, cognitive psychology experiments on divided memory very often look like OCD rituals. So this has an, ex uh, an, an effect on the accessibility of intrusive thoughts, but, 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 the sad truth is that there are what are called ironic effects to those uh, performances, and that, I will talk about the experimental evidence after that, but uh, in OCD, those patients who perform lots of rituals are also the ones that have the highest level of intrusive anxiety between those rituals. And it's... Uh, there could be a sort of common sense wisdom that, well, they are so anxious about their ideas that they have to perform lots of rituals. There's good, there are good reasons to think that it's because they perform their rituals about those thoughts that they reinforce the saliency of those thoughts. Um, this predicts that there'll be a certain dynamics of patients' rituals, which would be that, for example, uh, rituals will evolve towards a sort of optimum where they occupy working memory uh, to uh, a larger degree, sorry, require attention, con attentional control to a higher degree. Um, and if the patient makes them more automatic, because after all, you may learn to do your shoelaces three times with your left hand sticking out your tongue and uh, control the rest, uh, the prediction would be that then you will try to introduce a new thing. Okay. That your other hand should be like this, something like that. And uh, David Avon at uh, Tel Aviv has done very fine grain and incredibly nice studies of patients, and that's more or less what happens. That is, rituals become more automatic, people add something. And they add something else and so on. So, uh, what we think is that this is very close, and these are a few, uh, just a few, do I have time to talk more? Mm -hmm. No? Okay, well. Uh, these are just sort of little studies that we've uh, done where we use this uh, paradigm that's been uh, designed by Dan Wagner um, in forced pressure. And what Dan Wagner does is very simple sort of things of asking people not to think about X. Okay? And then they have five minutes during which they must do that. And, uh, and then they have a period when they're told, that's it, the experiment is over. So you think about whatever you want. And the idea is that, obviously, when you're told that um, you must not think about the white bear, uh, it's extremely difficult for five minutes to manage not to have any thoughts about white bears. There are strategies to do it. So what you measure is both the uh, levels of intrusion, the, the, the intrusive thoughts tend to pop up, but people can acquire strategies and be good at not thinking about white bears. And then once you're told, uh, that's it, the experiment is over, you have white bear images that sort of flood through your mind. <laughs> All that repressed stuff is coming down. So then we have done that. So we did some studies where what we did was to prime people, prime their hazard precaution system with films where we showed them, uh, you know, like hygiene propaganda film where you see someone sort of um, blowing their nose in the uh, in the hand and then shaking hands with someone <laughs> or uh, someone who's uh, sucking on a pencil and then giving it to uh, one sitting next to her and stuff. Or also films about assault and uh, things like that. And we measured the effects of ritualized behavior, XB24, versus non ritualized behavior. We had an operationalized uh, definition of what it is, which is that 
um, non motorized behavior was a uh, very difficult thing, like you know, threading needles and things like that. And ritualized was this combination of rules that you must put the needle in this, um, stick it in this roll of thread, but you must do it with your wrong hand three times and with your good hand twice, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm happy to, re to report that we had no effect whatsoever. What we did was to show, you know, horrible stuff like that, and uh, it should have been, should have had an effect, but well, it didn't. Um, but then what we did is another study that we haven't quite finished because we have many controls to do. Uh, that's more interesting, is to ask people, and it actually works, to ask people to generate a description of that thought which they don't like. Okay, uh, we all have these. Well, all of us who are normal have these. I have these. Um, um, for me, it's the thought of a very sharp razor going through my gum like this. You know, that kind of thing. Once I have this thought, and now, shit, uh, okay, I mean, it, <laughs> is it possible to get rid of it? It's there, you know, and you don't want it, but it's there, it's there, there, it keeps coming back. So we ask them, we describe them, this kind of stuff, and we ask them to come up with their thing. And then we do other tasks like, you know, uh, numerical cognition tasks, actually. <laughs> and then we just flash this thought, because they typed it in a computer and we just flash it on the screen, and we tell them, now we have five minutes where you must not think about it. And we'll help you by giving you these actions to, when we see the effect. Now, what you find is that there is an effect, that is, there's a much steeper repression. The intrusion from the uh, razor in your, your gums kind of thing is much less in the uh, ritualized behavior condition than in the other, and the steeper rebound is there too. That is, people complain, and we've had to talk to the human subjects, people because it's, people complain that after that it's for an hour, an hour, an hour and a half, they think about nothing else than their horrible thought. Um, I don't have the numerical stuff, but the effect is there. Now, okay, I showed you horrible things, so I wanted you to do some nice things. You have five seconds to forget your horrible thoughts <laughs> uh, by focusing on these images. Um, so we have this sort of model, which is about um, individual ritual, which is rather complicated, but says that you know, the, it's a bit of a modification of the Session and Woody safety uh, ritual, which says that um, the rigid uh, or one-step performance will create rigidity in performance um, to the extent that um, these performances you know, um, occupate or sort of um, have this effect on intrusion such that subjects have this sort of just right feeling, which is a reduction of anxiety. Um, Sechman, Woody, Gray, you know, all these people who work on the neuropharmacology of these things have uh, make a great song and dance about the fact that it's not exactly an anxiety reduction, it's the creation of another feeling that compensates anxiety. And they have reasons to do that, but we won't go into that. Now, okay, how do we explain uh, the fact that some people who are not patients have these things. Well, you know, we have general fears in pregnancy, like, you know, contamination, assault, poisoning, and things like that. Um, we've, we've run a study, and we're still doing that, a study of pregnant women and perinatal sort of populations to see uh, what kind of uh, scenarios people have. And uh, people have lots of scenarios about harming the infant, fathers and mothers. It's extremely common. And the reason why they don't say it so much is because we all have this sort of pop psychoanalysis kind of idea that if I have it, it must be that I'm drunk, that I'd really like to do it. I uh, remember having these thoughts about you know, being in the bathroom with sharp scissors. Uh, my son is there, he's only six months, and all he takes is so much. Uh, now, this kind of vivid uh, visual imagery is something that lots of people actually have. And then you think, I'm sick. And you're not. It's, I think, a good functional design because what you do in those circumstances when you have these kind of thoughts is that you're not zoning out at all, okay? You could zone out because I don't know if, you know, how many of you have had children, but when you have a three-month-old baby, you tend to zone out most of the time because you never sleep. So it's a bit like going clubbing <laughs> every single night of the week, and it's compulsory. So 
it's good to have things that bring you back to the potential danger in the situation. So you monitor danger cues. You don't monitor, you know, the high attention monitoring is not about other things in the environment. For children, uh, that's something else that we are studying at the moment. Um, we think that, this, uh, that children's rituals are a kind of calibration of their precaution system. Uh, they're trying to improvise precautions. They're trying to see, and the reason for, for why they should do that is that um, those in, um, potential threats, fitness threats, are not the same in all environments. So you have to learn the local sort of things. The predictions from that would be that obsessions or intrusives should become more cultural, as it were, more specific as children grow up. And the compulsions should become more reasonable. Um, well, we've done a few studies about that. Um, and yes, I mean, that's more or less what we see. First, there are different, different, different um, developmental schedules for these different kinds of uh, domains. Very young children are very much into predators and intruders, which they call monsters. Uh, between five, eight, or nine, uh, children become more interested in contagion and contamination. The monsters are still there. Uh, so that's the time when uh, American girls start thinking that boys have goodies. Um, good question. Goodies do not exist, so at least I think. <laughs> well, no, no, but there's something else. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the, I mean, goodies are also crap, so it's, it's something else. But in this sort of children's folklore, it's like, do you want to touch a boy? You wouldn't touch a boy because boys are goodies. Or blah, blah, blah. Okay. I'm deferring to my informants. So. <laughs> Social hierarchies and exclusion and things like that become subjects of incredibly high interest, as Dan was talking, was saying the other day, uh, at a certain age. You know, high school cliques are something that are the object of much more emotional investment than um, mid-school or you know, elementary school things. Also, in children's rituals, we find that, sorry, in children's anxieties and calibration, we find um, in our studies, and that's not very surprising, that um, there are all sorts of domains of potential danger that you can, you know, talk to them forever and they'll never pay any attention to. So, you know, how much we say that um, washing up liquid is not a good thing to drink, that um, you should stay on the pavement because cars are dangerous, children do not pay much attention to that. So three-year-olds who have extreme fear of predators in, um, you know, in posh neighborhoods in St. Louis, and there are no lions in St. Louis, okay? Not even bears, nothing. They have no fear whatsoever of crossing streets where there are things that are described to them emphatically, repeatedly as extremely dangerous objects. Moving on. Um, we also find these cultural effects. Uh, Zahor, and we've done some preliminary studies about that, show that uh, the prepotent fears in three-year-olds, five-year-olds seem to be the same in very different cultures. He's done it in Israel and India, and we're doing it in Africa and in the US, uh, whereas the fears about contagion and then fears about social things seem to be much more uh, focused on extremely sort of specific local sort of conditions. OK, uh, we should have talked about cultural rituals. Well, I can, I'll say a word about them. Yeah, the thing is that what happens in a cultural ritual is not very, uh, actually, theoretically, I think it's very derivative. Uh, that is, why are those um, ceremonies stable. This is a bit of a you know, special take on the Spurler theory that it's, it's, it's a real bother not to do them because people will get upset. But at the same time, there's a tiny bit of attraction to doing them. And what I'm trying to say is that in terms of uh, cultural contagion, all it takes is that tiny bit of attention demanding, compelling character for these things to uh, be stable. OK. What you have in cultural ceremonies is that you, you, there are messages from the environment. They could, they could be explicit, implicit, they could be complex or simple. But they are the form, we must perform X. You know. And usually it's not, we must perform X because it's got this causal connection to Y. We must perform X because it's got a non-obvious connection to Y. Uh, there's a danger in not doing it. What's going to happen if we don't perform the uh, annual you know, sacrifice to the ancestors? We don't know, but we don't want to know. Okay, we don't want to find out. Um, 
there's great scribbliness and rigidity in the messages. You know, you must do it this way. You must absolutely rotate the, circulate this chicken seven times clockwise, otherwise things are bad. But why they're bad is again not expl ex made explicit or doesn't have to be made explicit. There's no rationale for the, no rationale, sorry, for the um, mid-level actions. Yeah, pass on the next test. So. Now, so what happens is that you're given messages that mimic or resemble the input conditions for your hazard precaution systems. It looks like something that you should pay attention to because it's of the same sort. <coughs> there, you know, many uh, of those uh, social ceremony contexts are phrased in terms of invisible potential <coughs> danger or predation. There are witches around. They are like predators. They're trying to get you. You can see them. You have to do something about it. Also, the actions that are recommended in the ritual <coughs> mimic typical <coughs> actions that would be recommended by this hazard precaution system. You know, you're told that you should wash, you should cleanse yourself, uh, you should order the environment, and so on and so forth. And what we think is that because you have that, you have a small, uh, faint activation of this precaution system that is enough to make any recipe for social coordinated action that includes these things more stable than a recipe for social coordinated action that <coughs> doesn't include these things. So it's not like there's a um, great, uh, important, and theoretically profound reason why these things are culturally stable. It's just that they're culturally stable by virtue of activating some mental systems slightly more than variants that uh, than other variants. This has an important uh, corollary. Uh, for people who study rituals, rituals, ceremonies that happen, is that routinization and ritualization are exactly the opposite of each other. You know, lots of people say, well, rituals, come on, I go to Catholic Mass, and, and this is very boring, and I think about everything but, you know, what's going on there, because I, I could do it in my sleep, I, I know all the stuff, and probably if you're a Catholic priest, you can do it in your sleep. That's, but that's not the point. There's lots of routinization. Routinization is lowering of cognitive control. It frees working memory. <coughs> so as you perform your Catholic Mass as a Catholic priest, you can think about your mortgage or things like that. And it allows intrusions. But ritualized behavior is the opposite, where you have higher cognitive control and swamping of working memory. So uh, we, we should find both in what people call rituals. And that's why the theory of rituals is not terribly, uh, yeah, a, a terribly good thing to do. Okay, that's enough. Um, what I think is, it's time for transient conclusions, and um, I find it very uh, uh, useful usually to try to preempt criticism, but usually people find completely uh, stuff that I never thought about. But uh, so uh, we're not saying that religious performance is obsessive. Okay, contrary to Sigmund, we're not saying that obsessions are derived from religion. Again. Has a, uh, various people. Uh, we're not saying that ritual is pathological. We're not saying that there's a ritual center in the brain that would be in the basal ganglia. We're not saying that rituals are about fear or, a, or that they're an adaptation. We're not saying that. <laughs> what we're saying is that, well, you've heard that before. Uh, so, okay, that's it. I misuse this position and ask a question immediately. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I really like this stuff uh, for many reasons. And there is one reason that I don't know whether you will like, even the way you have presented uh, the giant. And I just would like to come back for one moment to, uh, to Freud. And I don't think it was totally fair to say that he stopped by saying yeah. that obsessive neurosis is you know, like, mm. it's like a uh, religious ritual and vice versa. Uh, he said something more. He did have a theory of uh, OCD. And his mm. theory was that there are certain uh, thought contents that you want not to come to mind. And as it happened, those thought contents have to do with the kind of thought contents that, or contents that you were describing, for example, um, incest and, uh, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, 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 and cleanliness <coughs> would be, you know, against the fear of contamination by uh, an incestuous thought coming to your head. And 
so, and he, you know, the other thing is that if he had the uh, knowledge about all the oxytocin and stuff, <laughs> you know, he would be the most happy about that. And he always said that, that we're going to end up in the brain, or in the mind, as we say. But, uh, so, um, there is, you know, I think all this is just uh, great scientific stuff, which is uh, an elaboration of uh, a thought on the right track by mm -hmm. the old master. No. Uh, yes, I mean, we're happy to stand on the shoulders of giants and kick the ladder at the same time. Uh, which is why, you know, it's, uh, it's always tempting to say that. The, the, um, what is certainly uh, interestingly sort of evocative of the uh, old man's moles is that what most what the safety models are saying is that there is a motivation to exclude a certain fault content from conscious intrusion. Yeah, and that's um, and also and that's interesting. But um, the Wegner experiments show that. The, the more you repress it, the more salient, precise, organized it becomes, and it has. So that's where there's um, a slight divergence, which is that um, what Wegener's experiments and all other things like that tend to suggest that the the, the fault contents that come back are the ones that are repressed. They're not masked. They're not transformed. On the contrary, they're made much more uh, precise. But okay, anyway, let's. Um, I have you can abuse your position. Yes? I would like to only add a lot of commentary, so yeah. uh, I will talk about only one. Uh, it's just about the swapping of um, mm. memory, and it seems to me that we have uh, in religious traditions two, two, two ways of dealing with changes. Mm -hmm. Like um, in possession cults that I know in Brazil mm -hmm. and so on, we have some kind of religiousification of the ritual script. Yeah. While in shamanism, mm -hmm. we okay. have improvisation. Yeah. And so it would be two ways of living with, with this kind of swamping. Mm -hmm. Because I, I have the impression that and the cults I know, uh, religiousification leads to routinate, routinization. Inization. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And in the two, two years of fuel I made, I, I haven't seen something like, because there is routinization, it must be a change to swipe my... Oh, oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that's interesting, because the dynamics of the actual sort of, and especially small-scale religious uh, um, uh, groups uh, should be really relevant to that, that kind of thing. What, what happens in... Um, I think routinization is one thing, um, and as you say, rigidification can lead to either of those outcomes, you know, routinization or some sort of attempt to add elements. But I think that all these um, other techniques, you know, like possession and things like that, are uh, so different from what, from that um, that they, you know, they belong to another repertoire of socially organized stuff that that we do. And, and it seems to me, it's um, yeah, this is only a model of a very small part of what happens because uh, if you realize like uh, for example Pierre Lina had this description of an African ritual where there is action like that which for each, each individual uh, takes about one minute over a three-day ritual but that minute they have to do you know in a special way the rest is just routinized to them it's completely uninteresting so you find this combination mm -hmm. Um, I think in your system it's problematic that you put together two affect systems, the disgust and the fear system. Mm -hmm. Because I think disgust system is processed in another part of the brain yeah, and yeah. has a, a very different yeah. concerning the, the causal, temporal relationships. Because in fear system, the cause of the fear is, is temporary, very near, so, so you see the tiger or the snake, mm -hmm. in the disgust system, based on contagion, mm -hmm. and germs and virus and poisonous things, the temporal mm, 
interaction between the causal agent when you meet with it and the effect that you get ill, it's quite far from each other. Yes, I am. And so mm -hmm. it's, you need a much um, uh, higher or more cognitive work on it to find the connection between uh -huh. the two things. That's and the other thing, I think that they found that in, um, in ritualized behavior and cultural things like morality, there is a very strong relationship because the moral judgment and the disgust process in the same part of the brain. And uh, if you wash your hands and you want to get rid of uh, a morally unacceptable thought of yours about your previous behavior, both, both the washing and the washing itself uh, uh, softens this thought. So there are a very strong connection between disgust and ritualized way of get rid of disgust, for example, washing mm -hmm. your hands, which was. Um, yeah, I mean, I, maybe and I didn't. Uh, and oh, I sorry. think the fear system somehow is very different from yeah, yeah. And maybe based on this disgust system and some mm -hmm. ritualized practice based on the disgust system could be transposed to fear system, but it's different. I think. Uh, maybe I didn't make it clear enough. I mean, the, the, uh, but that's exactly the distinction we're talking about when we say that there are uh, systems that are there to deal with imminent fitness threats. And those fear systems, described by, you know, Redu and people like that, are that. And they're neurally and cognitively and evolutionarily distinct from the ones that deal with um, the stuff I'm talking about today. So these are really different things. Uh, fear is not there. Um, this, uh, it's, well, it's interesting to what extent there's uh, sort of activation of fear systems as well. Uh, but in general, it's not that. This is completely different. Um, you, you, for example, and you have two pathologies that are very different. Pathology of fear system, PTSD is typical of, uh, fear system pathology. OCD is a typical precaution system pathology. And they're not neurally similar. They're not, you know, they don't know. So, yeah. Two short questions. One is, uh, can you see parallels between the, the orientation between ritualized and uh, routinized behavior? And uh, parallels to Whitehausen, Michaelinozen's most of religiosity? Mm. I like to think that I do, in very precise terms, things that could be done in less precise terms. But uh, it is, it's. Um, uh, We'll have to talk more about that. Okay. Um, first, briefly on the topic of discussed in here, I'll, I'll, in, in my next talk, I'll present some initial evidence of functional disaggregation of obsessions concerned with contamination and obsessions concerned with threats. Um, and I'll just leave that as a teaser now. Pascal, as you know, I like this general framework quite a bit, but to be consistent with my role here, I, I can't stop there. Um, <laughs> So one thing that, that I mean, you, ex you yourself expressed some skepticism about was the, the ordering ritual as a uh, intrusion detection system. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm skeptical about that. And having listened to Susan the other day, it strikes me that um, the concern with everything being as it should be, which, yeah. as you know, children exhibit, um, seems more like a theft detection system than a predator invasion mm -hmm. detection system to me. Because if everything you know, has to be, if the pencil has to sit to the left of the pen, and the pen has to sit to the left of the notebook, mm -hmm. and the notebook has to be in the same place on the shelf, then it's very easy to detect when um, someone has taken something. Uh, and uh, theft, it would seem to me, is you know, a, a principal concern. Now, you might say, why, you know, why children? Well, perhaps because if you can't count yet, right? Um, you know, if you can count easily, uh, then you can detect theft more easily, more readily than um, if you need to do some kind of matching system. And having a place for everything is a way where you can survey it relatively quickly. 
that's a point, a, a good point, and I think, but uh, yeah, okay, just to carry on with these um, things, it's, if that's the case, that's a sort of a more specific instance of a more general thing, which is intrusion from people whose interests diverge from yours. So uh, I didn't say it was uh, specifically predator intrusion, but sort of intruder, you know, intruder sort of detection in general, and I think, yes, what is, the reason why I'm skeptical about this argument is that, um, well, there haven't a single uh, piece of evidence that was supported, uh, which you know doesn't uh, and there was usually stop people from yeah. yeah. Being, yeah. But one thing that makes me think it may be there is that this is one of the uh, behaviors that those uh, OCD rats uh, seem to exhibit. They alter their environment, and I have no idea what the and the people who do these experiments have no idea why they would do that. And it could be also that they're trying to get conspecifics not to get there, you know, to their stuff. I, I don't know. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, um, one footnote to this discussion is that we're exchanging intuition on the basis of zero data because no one studies these things. And there's practically no study of childhood rituals except in the pathological case. The normal presentation people are not interested in because most clinical psychologists say, well, it's normal, so why bother? And cognitive psychologists are not, you know, for some reason, having mm. less of that. But so uh, in three or four years when we've done all our studies of childhood thing, I may have some evidence that would talk to this. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so Sorry. But uh, your, your, your talk is like really bringing back composite this repressed readings that I had done <laughs> a long time ago. And for example, uh, uh, there is, and being a Hungarian being here, I, let me just uh, share you a uh, um, uh, great Hungarian mm -hmm. other giant, Sandor Ferenczi, who in yeah. uh, uh, 1913 wrote a really intriguingly uh, unbelievable and uh, beautiful paper about exactly this topic, that uh, how, how he tried to explain how children's uh, collection, like ritualistic collective uh -huh. uh, behaviors change in their topic. Oh. And uh, the, he had a, an idea that, uh, well, first of all, this, uh, which has to do with contamination, in mm -hmm. a, uh, though he was putting it in the psychosocial state theory of uh, 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 passing through the anal stage, but basically that the child has an interest in his own feces. And if you really want to have an idea that will, you can use in this, just try to make people imagine eating their own feces. So mm -hmm. there is a, a, a thought content that will kind of be uh, slow back. And <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but the interesting thing is that, that babies do eat. They like to eat their own feces. Yes. And there is an enormous uh, uh, kind of socially induced repression on this. So his idea was that that there is originally the interest in your own feces, but the, the parents kind of don't like it and, and uh, punish you for that. And so, so you kind of repress it, and then you become interested in, in a kind of brown, wet stuff, like, like you know, uh, 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 playing in the mud. OK? But then repression goes on, and then you become interested in a thing in, in a, uh, uh, not wet sand, and then you become interested in uh, collecting stones, and he called it the stone, <laughs> the stone age. And you can actually, I used to teach this, and you can actually draw, like you take feces and make a, a, a kind of a feature analysis, and the depression goes like feature by feature, and it actually works beautifully. And, and then, because then you start to collect the marbles, and eventually you, uh, you know where you end up, you collect money. Nettles are very much the same. Oh, I'm sorry. Pascal. Yeah, so I found the the analysis of OCD extremely mm. interesting and convincing. And I see a vague analogy in the ritual. Mm. Um, but he, here's my and I I take that part of your argument was that by somehow co-opting these basic mechanisms, it's mm -hmm. part of an explanation of how rituals get stabilized. Mm -hmm. But how do religions come to co-opt that system in the first place? That is, 
Um, were you giving, I mean, this is a question, mm -hmm. it's not a challenge. Were you give it, giving us a, an account of that, or do you have one? No, I mean, I, I was offering what is um, um, simplistic and could be buttestable, probably, um, account in terms of contagion, cultural contagion, which is that uh, to the extent that your uh, recipe that you propose to other people uh, for that kind of thing, um, for coordinated action, um, includes these features, it will, that prediction tend to be more, uh, have more potential for stabilization than something that doesn't. Now, the thing is that um, as people get together, um, they have all sorts of things they do together. And uh, that those rituals, you know, ceremonies, people getting together and doing things, do all sorts of things like fishing expedition, uh, expeditions, uh, hunting, uh, marrying people, and so on and so forth. Now, all these functions are there, and all these reasons for being together and doing things together are there. Uh, the simple argument is that to the extent that a certain sort of random generation of, you know, how shall we do it, hose in on that kind of thing, then it makes it more. Uh, stable. Um, so uh, that account is not exactly, uh, no, an, a generation account, it's more transmission account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you talked about OCD mainly, but there are also uh, similar behaviors in other pathologies. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is yeah. this yeah. the same system in the syndrome or it's uh, very, yeah. for people with autism? Mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's very difficult to, yeah, and um, uh, we spent, you know, several years trying to acquire some basic knowledge of OCD and interacting with people who work with OCD patients and so on and so forth, and, and, and not with these other pathologies. And I don't really know how to expand that. It's true uh, that you find uh, repetitive uh, action in autistic uh, kids. It's not clear that the thematic sort of arrangement is the same. Okay, there's concern with pollution, danger, and things like that, responsibility instead of really thinking about other people that much. Um, another um, um, place where you see it is the uh, slightly impulsive or superstitious element of PTSD, where people try to get rid of their own obsessions you know, with the danger or the trauma they uh, think with rituals. Um, no, I don't know what's going on in these things. But I think one should, if one must pursue that kind of model, have something to say at some point about that. You're right. Yeah. Could I just add one thing to this? That uh, one in your list, I think uh, one of the clinical phenomena kind of uh, stood out as not belonging there. I, mean, I might be wrong about this hoarding. Yeah, yeah. Because hoarding yeah. doesn't have you know, the cleanliness aspect. Yeah, yeah. If people who hoard actually are, are, are neglectful about their bodily yeah, cleanliness. Yeah, yeah. It's more like schizophrenics, uh -huh. uh, I think, that who do that. And also, uh, it doesn't have the goal demoting no. aspect. No. So. Um, holders have a totally different neural signature from all other OCD cases. So uh, the current sort of wisdom in the field is that this is probably not an OCD uh, pathology. It's, I mean, in as much as there is such a thing as no TPC pathology, it's always a spectrum, but that is very far away because its um, neural signature is really very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, so let's indeed assume it seems uh, interesting and plausible that uh, there is this uh, hazard and uh, danger uh, uh, additional module and that it uh, helps stabilize the factor in the stabilization of rituals. Uh, um, Collective uh, institutional uh, Would you expect it to play uh, a similar role in other rituals, or are there are some rituals where the theme of danger and precaution and purity is quite present, and others where yeah. basically, you know, like celebration rituals or yeah. a transition ritual, where, it, where it, it, it's only a precaution against the non performance of a ritual? I mean, the yeah. only thing that can go wrong if you don't perform is that you have danger, but there's no external danger uh, that you're taking, uh, that you're trying to ward off. This is a complicated question because um, uh, th there's, a, as you know, a big complication to, to answer, a big difficulty in answering this question is at what level of description are you talking about? So um, typically, um, what anthropologists will tend to call a right more than a ritual would be a sort of you know one week thing that includes all sorts of specific actions. But inside these things, there are the specific actions that are there, for example, to tell the ancestors to be nice to us. Kind of thing. 
where you have a sort of social contract kind of precaution where you say, well, if we do this, they'll do that. Um, so um, I don't know, but the uh, prediction would be that, yes, of course, the optimum would be even stronger when the theme is to get rid of some disease and the, uh, the, the official sort of declared objective is to prevent uh, the occurrence of some disease and the theme is contagion. Or when the uh, official theme is to uh, get uh, people from the other tribes to uh, leave us alone, and the theme is all about invisible predation and danger. Yet, um, I'm not sure that works, and if it works, but that would be an interesting thing to test. The question is, at what level does it, does it work? Is it the big rituals, you see what I mean, or the small actions within those rituals, which is a big complication? Of course it is. But it, it would, I mean, it, it, one prediction would be then that those rituals which are directly about issues of danger and the mm -hmm. and so on, would uh, uh, tend to have more of these uh, repetitive uh, and so on features than we. Uh, if, you find, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, if you found that, you'd be pleased. Right? If exactly, you don't find exactly, it, you'd yeah, yeah, right, Exactly. <laughs> I, was, I was about to say, I wouldn't want to call it precaution, uh, the prediction of the system. If I found it, I would mention it as something that was predicted. <laughs> but um, because. You know, I mean, so to be honest, I mean, the, the, the system is just, this is just making this minimal claim, you know, to the extent that you have this activation, this, uh, first, the, the, the connection between the theme and the action that's recommended seems to make more sense than it would otherwise. Therefore, it's more compelling and it will be more stable. Now, if there are effects in, within the, variance, the variation of those rituals on that, that would be great. But, Question. So now we know that you know Yuri has come out as a closet fraud. Yeah? <laughs> 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 it's quite officially. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh yes, that's true. No, I'll run back. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you.